Good morrow, fair friends. My city was yawning out of its latest lockdown back when I wrote this, so I thought, why not celebrate by sitting inside and making a YouTube video? Anyway, we are at least thinking about outside because it's time to share the geography of my planet Dormum Alpha, and while I've mentioned some of these things before, it wouldn't make sense to skip them here. So, with no further ado... Ladies and gentlemen, her. Dormum Alpha is 0.8 times as big as Earth, but 1.4 times as dense, so its gravity is a bit stronger than ours. Aside from the obvious effects this will have on, you know, jumping and flying and stuff, stronger gravity means slightly lower tides, shorter mountains, and smaller animals, whose bones will also probably be denser than ours. I've mentioned before that Dormum Alpha's sun emits mostly orange light. This means that photosynthesis there is most efficient if plants absorb as much orange light as they can, so most of them have deep blue leaves. The few plants on Earth that have red leaves use the same strategy. But some of Dormum Alpha's plants protect themselves from harsh sunlight by reflecting that orange light and feeding on other wavelengths instead, so their leaves are brownish yellow. Green plants on Earth use this strategy. The first method makes most sense for Dormum Alpha's plants, since their sun is less than a fifth as bright as ours. That's also why their plants are dark colours, so they absorb more light. <laughs> it's a potted plant! <laughs> Dormum Alpha is 43 million years younger than Earth, which on a geological scale is like the difference between a pair of twins. At the point in its history I'll arbitrarily call the present, Dormum Alpha's in an ice age, at the start of an interglacial period like Earth is in now. It will return to glaciation in about 80,000 years. Four ice ages happened in its earlier history, between 2.9 and 1.8 billion Earth years ago, and there was another one about 260 million Earth years ago. That one played a big part in Dormum Alpha's only mass extinction of terrestrial life, but more on that next time. While we're talking about years, a Dormum Alpha year is 174.8 Earth days. A month, that is, the time it takes the moon to orbit the planet, is 18.4 Earth days. Also, their moon has weaker gravity than ours. That'll combine with Dormum Alpha's stronger gravity to create far weaker tides than we have on Earth. Aside from the obvious stuff like the blue plants, the size of the planet, and the slightly paler blue skies, another consequence of the sun's orange light, Dormum Alpha is very Earth-like. Its average temperature is about the same, and its axial tilt is only 6.6 .6 degrees higher than ours, so the seasons aren't too intense and the climate regions are all where we'd expect them to be. Also, a Dormum Alpha day is only seconds shorter than an Earth day, so we'll say they're the same, and because Dormum Alpha spins at the same speed as Earth, its prevailing winds and ocean currents circulate in the same way too. Oh, and it's a prograde planet, so the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Dormum Alpha's atmosphere is also very Earth-like, because chemistry is... Serious. Stuff. Just beyond me. Haha, <laughs> this is not for me. The only differences are that Dormum Alpha has a little more oxygen and carbon dioxide than Earth. More oxygen means more efficient breathing, so animals can grow a bit bigger without their respiratory systems failing than they could here. The planet's strong gravity will cancel this out though, resulting in organisms in the same range of sizes we see on Earth. More oxygen also means more fire, and denser air makes for more powerful winds, leading to catastrophic bushfires. Not that I'd know anything about those. That's so upsetting. The denser air will also make sound travel more easily, and will make flight more efficient. But again, the strong gravity will cancel this out, making it about as easy there as it is here. And 
I've shown you a map or two so far, but let me show you around. Oh, and there aren't many Conlangs of Babel yet, so expect lots of temporary place names. There are five continents, Northern, Southern, Oceanic, Equatorial, and North Equatorial. The Northern continent, as you might expect, wraps around the North Pole, and I call these regions the Old World and the Far East respectively, but this is also the only continent with any proper place names. We have Tokaj and Andej, and this whole region is Radaj. We'll spend a decent amount of time in Tokaj in the future, and you can probably guess it's there that a certain species more or less originates. The southern continent is the biggest, with an area of some 47.6 million kilometers squared, larger than both Americas, which is impressive given Dom Alpha's size. It's home to both the planet's highest mountain and its deepest dry land depression on the shores of that inland sea. The oceanic continent is in the middle of an ocean. What a surprise! Point is, it's really isolated. While the other continents are more interconnected, it's only loosely linked to the northern and southern ones by this great big island chain, which is called the Great Island Chain. Oh, and that big island? That's the Great Isle. Points for creativity. <laughs> She's got a point. She's an icon. She's a legend. And she is the moment. The North Equatorial continent's vague resemblance to Britain isn't intentional, by the way. These landforms were partly shaped by the super technical process of scattering some pins on my page and drawing a wiggly line around them. That said, the continents were also shaped by the actually super technical process of drawing tectonic plates and figuring out how they were moving against each other. Aside from shaping the coastlines, that also helped place my major mountains, islands, ridges and trenches on the ocean floor, and regions prone to earthquakes and volcanoes. Let's destroy them! Instead of making a simulation of how the continents would have moved, I figured that out and drew it by myself, which was a time. Honestly, I feel like they should have moved a bit further than they have, and the sea level should have changed more with the ice ages and greenhouse periods, but, you know, pick your battles and all that. The various colours on this map show where coal, oil and ore deposits can be found. Figuring out all this mining stuff was definitely low on the list of stuff I can be bothered to do, but I'm glad I did, because it'll play into patterns of trade later on. The only major difference between Dormum Alpha's geology and Earth's is that copper there is very rare, about as rare as gold. I made that choice because one of my minor goals for this world is to avoid an industrial revolution. In our world, copper is mostly used for electrical wiring, roofing and plumbing, and industrial machinery. And of course, it was also used to make tools in various cultures' Bronze Ages. I hope that by pruning copper from Dormul Alva's tech tree, I can lead their history down a different garden path than our own. You need to be locked in prison for a very long time. You are a danger to society. Like I said earlier, Dormum Alpha's climate is nothing special. Different biomes are all more or less where we'd expect them to be. These dark blue regions are tropical rainforests, their light blue surroundings are savannas, and the red areas are hot deserts. Things are more varied in the temperate zones, from warm, dry plains and bushland, to humid swamps, to deciduous woodlands, soaking rainforests, and barren cold deserts. Nearer to the poles, huge swaths of boreal forest give way to frozen tundra and ice caps. These dark grey blotches on the maps are my main mountain ranges. There are others, roughly here, but these are the highest, all of them over 5.8 kilometres high, with the highest at 8.8 kilometres. Of course, the planet isn't just a perfectly smooth ball with a few mountains sticking out like zits. 
Rivers have carved hills and valleys all over the place. And Actually, no, that's not the truth, Ellen. Okay, fine. I haven't drawn most of them in yet because it's really time consuming and I get bored. Well, she tried. At least, you know, she... Speaking of rivers carving out the landscape, though, these regions will have dramatic topographic features like caves, sinkholes, springs, stone forests, towering mountains, and plunging gorges. These are karst landscapes, formed as water dissolves soluble rock like limestone, and there's a lot of limestone in these regions. They used to be coastlines and shallow oceans, which is where most limestone forms. This particular region is no ordinary cast, though. Uh, let me add a little bit of spice to that. It has all the usual stone formations and cave systems, but tectonics and glaciers have carved into it too, creating a landscape like Huangshan in China, which was also formed by glaciers. It also means that the depression around this sea is more than a kilometer below sea level, more than twice as deep as the Dead Sea. The carbon dioxide in the air is concentrated enough to be toxic at this depth, so it's not exactly animal friendly, and it's actually too much even for plants. It's hell in there, it's horror. We've looked a lot at the continents, so let's land a thought to the skies and seas. Dormum Alpha's prevailing winds interact with the landscape to create unique and powerful weather patterns. They determine where cyclones form and then hit land, and where one can expect tornadoes and heavy thunderstorms too. This region in particular will be a thunderstorm powerhouse, thanks to the warm climate, high mountains, and converging winds. I imagine they'll rage year-round, like at Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela. There's also a regular circulation of winds and sea temperatures over this ocean, which has another super creative name, by the way. The same sort of thing as the El Nino Southern Oscillation that occurs over the Pacific. Basically, every few years for several months at a time, one of two feedback loops will form. The first one has strong easterly winds bringing floods, storms, and humidity to the west, and droughts and heat waves to the east. The second one does the opposite, with weak easterlies bringing humidity to the east and dryness to the west. Also, these green regions of ocean are fairly shallow and home to huge reefs, and the dark blue areas are the best regions for fishing. That'll be good to keep in mind later when I'm figuring out what my different cultures rely on for food and trade. Mmm, very good. And that's all for now. But I've built an awful lot of mountains, islands, and rivers and such, but it's kind of quiet here, huh? Kind of lonely. I think it's time to explore some more animate territory next time. And on, friends. Uh, hi. Hello. It's me, post-credits. Um, this video took so long to make, uh, and I'm really proud of it, but it did also kind of kill me, so I really, really hope you enjoy it. Um, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.